it's an extraordinary molecule that is truly has is endowed with many properties that we do not see in other macromolecular components of the cells. The biosynthesis of ribonucleotides with very minor variations is basically the same in all living systems. That suggests that it's a monophyletic trait that evolved very early. And so once you have ribonucleotides, they can be polymerized, either by RNA polymer, different kinds of RNA polymerases. But um, I think that it's fair to say that you can divide RNA in two main traits. One can have coding RNA as in an RNA virus, as in messenger RNA. And if we will go to the non-coding RNA, we can have very small non-coding RNAs. We can have large non-coding RNAs, like ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, the primer, and so on. If we want to have DNA, we require the oxyribonucleotides. And here we have a wonderful example of the so-called Horowitz hypothesis, in which you just add one step to have are different in biochemical pathways, and you can have the oxyribonucleotides, which are always, always synthesized uh, by, uh, from uh, ribonucleotides. And one thing that we have been concentrated in my lab is in the analysis of modified ribonucleotides, specifically coenzymes that I already mentioned, alarmones and histidines. I will not elaborate on coenzymes, I already spoke about them briefly, but let me show you the case of alarmones, which are absolutely fascinating. The most well-known alarmone that everybody quotes in all the textbooks and so on is cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is a modified ribonucleotide. And I can show you three different reactions catalyzed by uh, ribozymes that can actually lead without any problem to cyclic uh, AMP. But there are other alarmones that we normally do not teach to our students or not learn enough about them. Uh, we have words guanosine, we have adenosine, we have these um, complex uh, polyphosphates like APPPA, we have intermediates in the biosynthesis of uh, purines like ICA, um, we have CTATP, which is uh, also a precursor, if you wish, of purines, we have ATP, cyclic AMP, and PPGPP. So clearly, here you have a whole set of regulatory and signaling uh, molecules that are derived from ribonucleotides that is telling us that this could quite easily be derived from an RNA world in which you had already RNA molecules or ribonucleotides available. And finally, the other uh, molecule that I found fascinating, together with Marie-Christine Morel, of course, is histidine. All of us know that histidine is a very peculiar amino acid. It's the only amino acid that is endowed in to, uh, with an imidacil group. And of course, we know that um, the hydrogen and the N5 is the one involved in acid base catalysis. We know very well that it plays a key role in all, most, most of uh, enzyme uh, activities, examples one can think of. It's an, uh, it's an amino acid that we have never found in meteorites. I have spent about three years trying to look for histidine in, in uh, meteorites with no success at all. It may be uh, the outcome, the negative results may be the outcome of an artifact. It's always feasible that, that we are destroying the molecule when we are trying to analyze it. It's a molecule for which we have no good prebiotic synthesis, that's also need to be said. But when we look at the pathway uh, of the synthesis of histidine, it's not only the only uh, amino acid that is endowed with um, the imidacil group, it's also the only amino acid that we, we know of that starts with uh, ATP, with a ribonucleotide. And uh, the pathway of the, going from PRPP, which is a phosphorylated sugar, uh, and ATP has been studied in tremendous detail by Renato Fani, our collaborators, myself, and so on. We know where are the enzymes that actually that uh, underwent duplications, uh, internal duplications, double duplications, and so on. We can reconstruct the history of the pathway, but nobody really knows how the actual pathway started. But here you have a superb example of what Harold White said. Perhaps histidine is nothing more than a modified ribonucleotide that found its way in evolutionary terms in the active site of enzymes where the role originally may have been played by a ribonucleotide. So it's another fascinating example, I think, that uh, allows us to say that ribonucleotides are, of course, the monomers of RNA, are energy-carrying compounds, are the precursors of the oxyribonucleotides, are coenzymes or precursors of coenzymes, are precursors of histidine, and are alarmons or precursors of um, uh, alarmons. 
So quite clearly, not only RNA, but the monomers actually play very key roles in current biology. And um, I think it's very fair to say that the catalytic, the regulatory, and the structural properties of RNA molecules and ribonucleotides combined with their extraordinary ubiquity in all cellular processes are consistent with the proposal that there was that they play a key role in the origin and early evolution of life. Now, there are some people that do not agree at all with this idea. Some people will say, no, RNA is a late camera and so on. If that is the case, nevertheless, if we don't accept that RNA play a key role in the origins of life, we have to come up with reasonable, reasonable explanations on how the, these manifold roles of RNA actually became so evident in the history of biology. So I think it's fair to say that if we have this clear understanding of the role of RNA, then the question is, what is the ultimate origin of RNA? Or in other words, how did the RNA world came into being? And it's very easy to propose that there was RNA formed in the primitive soup. The problem is that RNA is very unstable. Everybody knows that. But there are additional problems. Um, I think it's, uh, one can address the issue of did RNA form prebiotically? Was RNA, were RNA molecules available in the primitive soup, in the, in the primitive earth? Well, it's true that a wide array of purines in to a lesser degree, pyrimidines, as I already mentioned, are found in meteorites and can be synthesized abiotically. So this supports the idea that the bases were available in the primitive earth. Now, ribose and ribose derivatives, together with other sugars, are formed quite easily in the so-called foremost reaction that I will speak about, and have recently been synthesized under interstellar cloud conditions. This has been actually achieved by the, by the French group, basically. Um, and uh, the foremost reaction was first described in 1861 by Butlerov. It's an autocatalytic reaction. It's actually the only example of a prebiotically significant reaction that is autocatalytic. We can form, without any problem, um, uh, sugars from formaldehyde. Formaldehyde in itself is all real carbohydrate, if you think about the formula. But um, if we do the experiment, we form not only ribose, but as you can see, pointed out by these two arrows, we form um, uh, an antiomeric amount of L-ribose and D-ribose, together with many other sugars. And by no means ribose is the most abundant sugar. So this is telling us that, again, if there was ribose in the primitive earth, how did we select for D-ribose and not for the others? Um, nevertheless, this problem notwithstanding, I think that the recent, re group, um, the recent results from the French group are fascinating because you can see in this multidimensional chromatographic analysis that if you take um, the ices that are normally found in the interstellar clouds where planets and stars are formed, you irradiate them with UV light or whatever, with any, any energy source, you form quite easily many, many different sugars. Again, you form ribose, the alpha pyranose uh, form of ribose, as you can see right there in the middle, and you can form to, uh, uh, other sugars. Um, actually, the array of sugar that is formed under these clearly hostile conditions is truly amazing. So, if we find a way of selecting ribose first and then the ribose over the other sugars, we would have one of the other components of RNA available under prebiotic conditions. And what I think is absolutely fascinating, and people tend to forget about this, is the fact that we find ribose derivatives in uh, the Murchison meteorite. I already mentioned to you the significance for, of meteorite for our understanding of the chemistry of the primitive earth. So, uh, it's very important to go back to these results by George Cooper from NASA Ames, in which you can see that you can find the two are alcohols there, it's the second column, um, and you can see without any problem ribitol and this isomers, ribonic acid and so on. So you, we find ribose derivatives in a sample of the primitive Earth solar system chemistry. So this supports the idea that not only purines, not only pyrimidines, but also ribose and other, other sugars were available in the primitive earth. The problem is that sugars are, chemical, are chemically very unstable. It's very difficult to accumulate sugars for a long time. That's the reason why cocktails are so popular, among other things. And the prebiotic mixtures 
everything that we know shows that uh, the ribose will exist as an open chain aldehyde with an alpha and beta pyranose and furanose forms and in, uh, in the enantiomeric uh, amounts of the L and D form. We also lack a good phosphorylation chemistry model for the primitive bird, and there is no obvious mechanism for prebiotic olig oligomerization. You can always put prebiotic, you can always put um, nucleotides in a pond, you can evaporate it, and this, yes, you will form a small strands of RNA, but uh, they are very small, they are not stable enough, and nobody is really satisfied with this kind of model. And one issue that I found particularly depressing is the fact that under anoxic condition, inorganic phosphate, which will be required to have the nucleotides is very easily sequestrated by hydroxyapatite into a way in which it becomes not available for phosphorylation reactions. So clearly here we have a problem that as of today, nobody has come up with a very good solution. Nevertheless, these problems notwithstanding, uh, I think it's fair to say that now we have two options. Was the RNA world formed by unknown prebiotic chemical synthesis, as is the argument by John Sutherland in England, a very apt uh, organic chemist that is, has been able to synthesize many of the components of RNA quite easily, or is it the evolutionary outcome of what people call pre-RNA worlds, like peptide nucleic acids and so on. So this is a very open question regardless of it. I think it's fair to say that we can come to a, a reassessment of Operin's original ideas. Operin was convinced, many of uh, our colleagues are convinced that there was a reducing atmosphere and that led to the synthesis of organic compounds, to quasar base, to anaerobic heterotrophic bacteria. I think that by now, our understanding of the primitive earth is such that we have no problem recognizing that in addition to the compounds that may have been formed on the primitive earth, there was an input from meteorites, from comets, from asteroids that led to the accumulation of organic compounds under prebiotic conditions. These may have included included not only amino acids, but also sugar derivatives and so on. Um, we recognize RNA as an intermediate stage in this sequence of events leading to the origins of life. And from the RNA world, it's not so difficult, I believe, to understand what the stage that followed that was the appearance of modern type of cells. There are many question marks in this uh, scheme, of course, but I think that this reassessment of the idea of chemical evolution can lead to very valuable experiments. I would like to say to you that this is the way I think that life appeared on Earth. It's something I cannot uh, uh, confirm, of course, but I think that we have to realize that epistemologically, in historical disciplines like evolutionary biology, more than a proof of what happened, what we require is a coherent historical narrative. We don't need to transform a cocodrile in the lab into a hen to demonstrate that indeed there is an evolutionary connection. We can look at the sequences, we can look at the way embryos develop, we can look at their behavior, and this provides proof enough to uh, construct a reasonable story of what happened in the transition from cocodriles to birds. And I think it's exactly the same with origins of life. It is impossible to demonstrate that this is the pathway that led to the origins of life, but all the available evidence that we have from widely different fields is consistent with the possibility that indeed this is how it happened. Thank you very much. Through a pairing, they would have stabilized the two. 
A second question, uh, which factors could have moved them to an increased presence of the ribose? Um, I think that the, uh, that the genetic code originated in, the, in, a, in a world dominated by RNA, basically. Um, actually, if you look at DNA, is just a carrier, a molecular carrier for, for the code, if you wish to put it that way. And uh, I think it's easy to understand the selective pressure, pre uh, pressures uh, in choosing uh, DNA over DNA for storing genetic material because it's much more stable. You don't have the OH uh, group in the, in the two prime carbon of sugars that make it much more stable uh, and so on. And uh, I think it's a case of uh, specializing the biochemical tasks that led to the to the appearance of, uh, of DNA. Uh, if you look at uh, ribonucleotide reductases, you have three kinds of them. One of them is fully anaerobic, the other is aerobic, the other is uh, moitié moitié. And um, I think that what we're witnessing there is simply the adaptation to increasing concentrations of oxygen. And I think that the anaerobic one is the old form, the oldest form. Um, if you look at the overall structure of the molecule, if you look at the sequences, the ribonucleotide reductases are do not appear to be homologous. But if you look at the three-dimensional structure, the catalytic side is very highly conserved and the kind of chemistry that it performs is very unique in biology. So I think that's good for a, for, sorry, for a monophyletic origin. Now, uh, why did ribose become so conspicuous, uh, so uh, predominant? No, I think it was already there. I think that the basic traits of biochemistry had been developed prior to the uh, evolutionary development of DNA. Which doesn't mean that you do not use them afterwards. For instance, as nerves are clearly latecomers in evolution. And I think that there you have a case of uh, opportunistic uh, attitude of uh, cells in which they choose something that's already available and can be used to many other functions. There is a way of trying to understand which of the many roles of RNA are older than the others. Uh, and that would be, for instance, to look at the kind of uh, roles they perform, the kind of molecules they bind to, and so on. Nobody has done that analysis, by the way. So, in other words, you think that the presence of the oxyribonucleotide had no uh, structural effect on the building up of the RNA molecule? No, I think it basically displays. This is a very general answer to your question, but I think it basically displays RNA to an intermediate role. And uh, it's perfectly clear if you look at the structure of DNA and RNA polymerases, DNA polymerase A, DNA polymerase B, the viral polymerases, that the changes required, for instance, in the polymerase were truly minor. So, yeah, I think it was basically a displacement of, of RNA. Thank you for the talk. Um, I heard once that uh, one problem of the uh, primitive soup is the dilution of the components. And uh, uh, scientists proposed that um, the formation of ice was uh, helpful to uh, concentrate all the molecules. But are you convinced by this hypothesis, in, especially in terms of uh, kinetic of reaction in the cold? I think that's a very important question because it leads to what is now the trend in prebiotic synthesis. If you look at the Miller experiment, the Miller experiment was an overall simulation of the primitive Earth. The assumption that you had a reducing atmosphere all over the planet and that you had a widely available energy source, which are thunderstorms and so on. The trend in our simulations nowadays is actually to go to, uh, has led to the recognition of microenvironments. Uh, you can actually synthesize different compounds under different kinds of environments. You can synthesize amino acids in a CO2-rich atmosphere. We have achieved that without any problem. Uh, you can synthesize, you can polymerize compounds using clays or using uh, the drying uh, 
model of a small lagoon. You can synthesize compounds in uh, hydrothermal vents. And uh, I'm always very amused to see how upset are mo mostly my American colleagues by the fact that one prefers one model over the other one. And my argument is a very gastronomic type of model. Why are Chinese cuisine, Mexican cuisine, Indian cuisine so sophisticated? Because if it moves, it's edible. You never despise a source of organic compounds. So if you can synthesize the organic compounds under cold or wet or hot or neutral air conditions or they come from outside, that's perfect. The, the richer the soup, much the better. Now, there is um, a fascinating model that was proposed almost as a joke by Leslie Orgeller and Stanley Miller, which is the so-called eutect eutectic freezing. Um, and they actually base their idea on the ways on the way that uh, alcoholic spirits are synthesized, are formed, are produced in Scandinavia. You take uh, the mixture of alcohol and water, and then you freeze it, and then you separate the water, and you keep doing it that all the time. And then, as they told in, they brought in a paper, you achieve a very reasonable and satisfying concentration of alcohol. Well, <laughs> If you do the same with, uh, with uh, molecules, uh, you actually synthesize very efficiently not only amino acids, but also uh, nucleotides. So I think it's, if you think of the Earth nowadays, it's, you have uh, cold places, hot places, and so on. So I think it's a very reasonable model for the accumulation of compounds, albeit much more slowly than you will have, of course, in places with a warm temperature. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so, so the energy world, uh, uh, the economic catalyst, of course, gave a very satisfactory answer to the chicken and egg problem. But underneath this, this uh, question is the fact that uh, the life is actually associated with uh, Darwinian in evolution, selection, which is very reasonable. But the second assumption is that uh, this Darwinian in evolution is actually uh, linked to uh, a molecule, a type of molecule which is carrying genetic uh, information. Uh, but as we pointed out, I mean, this is very difficult to imagine a prebiotic uh, system which would give rise to a single type of molecule that would uh, uh, carry this, uh, these characteristics. So uh, there are these alternative uh, uh, schools uh, uh, that actually advocate that you, you, you should take this problem uh, uh, apart because it is already a late uh, steps in, 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 in life and we should consider more the, the, the problem in terms of uh, uh, entropy uh, to, to find some type of uh, uh, entropic uh, uh, system which would actually uh, have some kind of heredity. So you have not address this question at all, I think maybe just at the end of the, the talk. I, I don't know what is the stage of uh, thinking uh, now about this type of theories. Can you Sure, absolutely, by all means. The, um, the fact is that uh, if you had RNA in the primitive earth, for sure you had many other molecules, for sure. I mean, RNA is so difficult to synthesize and to keep uh, in reasonable conditions, being so unstable, and it's so easy to find not only amino acids, amines, and many other compounds, but also lipids, that uh, it's very easy to picture a world in which RNA actually condensed, formed, reacted inside liposomes or other type of vesicles. This will provide you right away with a microreactor, which is very useful. There are experiments showing that, showing that indeed this can lead to polymerization reactions and so on. But also you can have root selection if you wish, which is of course one of the complex, because some liposomes will be more stable than others and so on. This is a stage that was developed conceptually by Oprah in using quad surveys, and people forgot about them. And now you have groups like the Demers uh, in California, Jack Chostak in Harvard, and so on, uh, studying the role of liposomes in uh, with uh, molecules uh, leading to much more complicated systems. Um, the problem of entropy I don't find so hard, because after all, the Earth was never an adiabatic system. The Earth was losing constantly, we still are losing hydrogen. 
uh, we had sunlight coming uh, all the time. We had um, uh, the input of meteorites, comets, and so on. So I think that if we look at the Earth as a whole, then uh, the issue of entropy is strongly diminished. Uh, and I, I should say that my uh, colleagues from physics that are interested in the origins of life are now much more keen on complexity, which has become sort of a buzzword for many things, than on the issue of entropy. Thank you, Antonio, for this uh, wonderful talk. Yes. Uh, I, uh, I would like to know your advice about uh, the role of minerals. So, the role of minerals, oh, yes. yes, such as uh, iron, sulfur, etc. Because it is obvious that today there are the remains of uh, ancient life according to the role they played in, uh, for instance, in several proteins. And uh, so I would like to, as you don't, uh, it is not incompatible with the heterotrophic theory of the origin of life. So I would like to know your, what your thought on this. Thank you, sure, with pleasure. I, um, we don't see minerals in uh, uh, very ancient cells. We don't see clays in ancient cells, but we can use clays as condensing agents to form chains of uh, oligopeptides or to accumulate uh, lipids and so on. And if actually if you look at a lipid, one can easily think of the surface of the lipid. And the first to do this was Guy Rison, who was a very distinguished lipid chemist, chemist here in France. Who was comparing the outside of a liposome with, uh, as a catalytic surface with uh, a clay surface. And some clays indeed are known to very effectively promote uh, a number of reactions, both in synthesis and the composition of organic compounds. Uh, the idea behind the use of clays and minerals is that we see the remnants of those molecules in the metals that are essential for the catalytic uh, roles of many enzymes. A very good example would be the zinc in the case of polymerases. And there is a fascinating experiment that was done by Leslie Orgel a long time ago in which he had a template and then he had activated ribonucleotides, activated with an imidazole group. And um, actually, he used imidazole group after we were able to synthesize it prebiotically. So he said, okay, I'll just say it's reasonable. And then he uh, tried to polymerize the molecule in the absence, of course, of an enzyme. And if he used zinc, the efficiency of the polymerization reaction was 100%. And the bonds that were formed were three prime, five prime bonds all along the molecule. All along means along 15 uh, ribonucleotides. If he used, uh, um, let me see, if he used plumbum, uh, uh, how do you say it in English? Lead. lead. Sorry, lead. lead. Yeah, I put it in, in Latin. Uh, lead. If you use um, lead, cobalt, and nickel, the efficiency of the polymerization dropped down tremendously to 20% or less. And the bonds that were formed were basically two prime, five prime bonds, which are not natural. So this is a very good indication of the role of metals that may have been bound to minerals in the primitive earth. Now, there is a very famous theory proposed by Gunther Becker-Hoyser that says that pyrite play a key role in the origins of life. And I think that the main achievement of uh, Vector Hoiser was actually to uh, recognize the catalytic role of pyrite in reducing a number of compounds, especially in molecular nitrogen into ammonia. There's, there are beautiful experiments uh, by that. The idea was tested by Dorr and others in Germany. It's a fascinating example. But he also claims that the sulfur iron cage that we see in a number of proteins are, is a remnant, an evolutionary remnant on, remnant on what was the origin of, of, of pyrites on, on surface, <coughs> on, on the surface of pyrites. Well, the problem is that um, that the kind of chemistry, the chemistry that depends on sulfur iron cages complexes is not found 
in very ancient enzymes, but in more modern type of metabolic enzymes. So it may be that uh, the model is wrong, but the recognition of the role of minerals, I think, is fascinating. Minerals were clearly a component of the primitive earth, and we cannot do without them. Oh, here. I go. <laughs> Thank you for the exercise. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for that great presentation. I was uh, <clears throat> just wondering where, in your opinion, does uh, DNA catalysis fit into that pattern, if at all? Because um, there's been like dozens of uh, DNA enzymes and, um, that yeah. have been isolated in the lab, and they're uh, extremely potent, as, uh, as efficient as ribozymes. So where does it fit, if at all? Okay, okay. Let me answer with uh, by quoting Leslie Ordeal. Uh, when he first learned of the experiments done by Jerry Joyce with catalytic DNA, he said, it appears that nature couldn't care less about inventing catalytic DNA because by then RNA and proteins were already there. So I think it's a wonderful example of the flexibility the DNA molecules can take. I think it's a, a flexibility in spatial terms and therefore for catalytic effects. But I think they are really late timers. Thanks. Thank you. More questions? So if not, uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, of course, thanks to Antonio for his uh, fantastic talk. It's very inspirational. Thank you. Um, I also have to thank Laura Barrio, Christian Brenner. They couldn't be here, but they helped a lot in the organization of uh, these this seminars and, and the other seminars of the series. Uh, I ha we have a little present for you that I, I was supposed to give you now, but I forgot it in the office, so <laughs> I imagine that I'm doing the, the, the formal thing here. <laughs> and so with this, I, I would like to close the seminar. And I want to tell you that the next seminar from this series will be the 8th of September will be given by Thomas Boone from the Max Planck of Immunobiology and Epigenetics. He will tell us and he works, he has a fantastic work in the evolution of immune systems, so I really recommend it. And you will be notified by email, of course. So thanks for coming.